Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. I was told that people who have gender dysphoria need to transition. Like, they can't survive without transitioning. And where I made a grave error was thinking that I needed to change my body. To everyone celebrating Transgender Day of Visibility, I want you to know that your president sees you. And we're committed to advancing transgender equality in the classroom, on the playing field, at work, in our military, in our housing and healthcare systems, everywhere, simply everywhere, simply everywhere, simply everywhere, simply, 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 simply everywhere, simply everywhere. Parents are terrified to take their children to the doctor. I see this all the time in parenting groups. They say, my child has anorexia, my child is self-cutting, my child threatens suicide. Where can I take my child for help? You take the child to the emergency room, the emergency room's going to move them toward transition. And if you don't agree as a parent, you're going to get cut out of the equation. If you are a licensed medical professional and you have a girl who doesn't feel comfortable being a girl, identifying as a girl, living as a girl, and you help her feel comfortable being a girl, that's considered conversion. But if you give that girl testosterone, if you perform it of a mastectomy on that girl, if you convert her into a boy, that's considered affirmation, right? It's totally Orwellian language. I went cold and I started shaking and I thought, I must be misreading this because it sounds like they're trying to ban the kind of therapy that helped me. How are you going to heal a wounded heart by operating on people's genitals? And yet, my profession fully embraced that now. Treating them with hormones and surgery doesn't fix a broken identity. I was in worse condition than when I initially started. I had more problems seven years down the road than I had when I first transitioned. The present stage of the sexual revolution amounts to a vast intergenerational science experiment. I mean, essentially, in a nutshell, is a kind of a, a war with reality. So much of this movement, the trans movement, is it doesn't want to recognize the obvious limits to humanity. We want to be God to form our body and our image and make it how we want it to be. In the old world, God was the hero, the creator, the one who created us with a nature to which we had to conform ourselves in order to flourish. The modern narrative is really one where Satan is the hero. We live in an age where the body itself has become very depersonalized and objectified. And this is really death dealing. It, indeed, the very definition of death is the separation of the body and the soul. I wish I could just like very harshly say to my young pre-testosterone but trans-identifying self like don't do any of this, don't go on T, don't get surgery, don't even change your name, like just, just stop. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 476. Available now on digital and DVD is Disconnected, a documentary that delves into the historical, cultural, and spiritual consequences regarding the recent social phenomenon of gender transition amongst teenagers and children. Illuminating and heartbreaking in equal measure, Disconnected is a must-watch documentary that deals with an important subject with an unflinching eye, compassionate heart, and pressing sense of urgency. And joining me now is the director of Disconnected, Don Johnson. Don, I thank you so very much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Matt. Appreciate it. So, if, and I just want to put out there before we begin, if anyone wants to find Disconnected online, you can go to disconnectedmovie.com. Um, Disconnected, by the way, is, is spelled D-Y-S. C O N N E C T E D, um, just in case people uh, can't, can't find it there. But at disconnectedmovie.com, and you can find um, 
uh, purchase for both the streaming and the DVD uh, hard copy as well. We all know how much we love our hard copy. I don't know about you, Don, but I've got a, a vast library of DVDs and Blu-rays, and I don't think they've, they've become, you know, obsolete yet. So uh, I'm going to oh, hold on to it for a while. I agree with you, Matt. In fact, they're more important than ever, I think. Uh, as handy as it is to have the digital streaming, having that hard copy is essential. All the books that I buy, <laughs> you know, I may have a Kindle copy, but I try to get the hard copy too. Same with movies, because frankly, the digital stuff is just too ethereal, too easy to erase, too easy to forget. Uh, fine. So yeah, definitely get buy the stream and the DVD. Absolutely. Um, in this documentary disconnected it's your third documentary and uh, they put together for your own um your own picture house runaway planet pictures and um what's really interesting is that the the first couple of documentaries the first one had to do with your conversion from protestant protestantism to catholicism the second movie had to do with sexual revolution the sexual revolution um here we were talking about uh, gender transitions um it's it's a pressing issue these days i mean it just becomes such a big Big kind of like eye store, both for kind of like uh, social, you know, socially and culturally and, and in every area sort of way. I imagine the huge impact that this subject has just like has in all kind of facets would have been just such an interest to you as a documentary filmmaker. And um, and I imagine approaching it, um, you know, well, I, let me just ask a question. I mean, is that why you wanted to make the documentary? Because there was just so much of it out there that you wanted to delve into the subject not only because you want to make a good story but you i'm sure you yourself as that person would have just been so fascinated with what's going on here yeah well that's the thing i mean as a as a father just as a person living in the culture i i teach you know i'm in the school system and uh you, you do business and it's just everywhere you know it's just attacking every every film that comes out every oh, yeah. story on tv i mean it's just everywhere um so yeah i mean on one hand I thought, hey, this is a good story. I mean, as a filmmaker, if it's not a good story, you, you know, you, as interested as you might be, you know, you're not going to make the film. So um, I did I did find it to be a, a fascinating story and something that's that I thought would would tell well, if you will. But, yeah, I think, more, I mean, primarily even just as a dad, I got four kids and three of them are girls and, you know, from 12 to 20. And it's just such a crazy time to, for them <laughs> that as a dad, I almost wanted to be like, uh, for almost even if it was just for them, you know, if if they were the only people to see it, it'd be it'd be worth it. But um, beyond that, it's just affecting so much of, of the world that I thought we we got to get to the bottom of this. I got to figure out what's going on because it's just uh, amazing how it has exploded so quickly and so widely. It's I so I've I've seen a couple of documentaries in regards to this, and I've I've, I've read um a couple of books, and I'm always kind of like um interested in the subject myself. And what's really fascinating to me is how in the last several years the alarming number of teenage girls have really taken on um the whole kind of like tra gender transition and and from what i've read and whole, this whole kind of gender dysphoria in, in a lot of ways is um almost kind of equivalent to like maybe in the 90s where eating disorders or anorexia would have been really prevalent or in the 2000s where perhaps like self mutilation or cutting would have mm -hmm. been really prevalent it's almost kind of like a self-therapy kind of thing but the the consequences of gender transition is that it's just, you know, um, just much bigger than any of the, the previous things I was talking about. The movie starts off, you interview Daisy Strongen, who is in the process of the transitioning, and, and she chronicled her transition, um, her original transition from female to male on social media. And she even un un undergone top surgery, which is really kind of just, you know, really gone gone there um how did you find daisy um in in the process of all this did you know of her beforehand or do, did you come across come across her in the process of researching uh this documentary because she's just a a really fascinating person I, I, and i think a really courageous person as well yeah absolutely no, daisy's amazing uh it's just so brave and and uh to, to tell her story. You know, as with many of them, I actually started out with maybe two or three people that, that I wanted to talk to, you know, like Ryan Anderson, who had wrote a great and written a great story. Uh, when Harry became Sally, uh, my friend Abigail Favalli has, has a book out, The Genesis of Gender, or she was working on it at the time, I think. And so I started with them, actually, like, look, can I talk to you about this? Um, what's going on here, just from sort of a, a researcher to researcher. And then they actually, uh, it was Abigail, 
um, Favali who turned me on to Daisy as, hey, I talked to her for my book. Maybe you'd like to talk to her. Um, she had actually had a little clip on 60 Minutes. Uh, I had seen her. <laughs> and so, I, you know, you reach out to a lot of people and not, not everybody says yes. Daisy was very gracious. We visited her a few times, actually, in Chicago over the course of filming. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just like the doors kind of open uh, as you start – interacting and networking with people that uh you see well hey who's who's willing to talk and frankly matt i was i was disappointed in a lot of people that i thought would be willing to talk mm. about this they were absolutely not i mean they agreed with me right they understood like they knew my position on it uh, that i was concerned they agreed but they were absolutely not going to go on camera for it whereas some people you thought you know like daisy for example that's a tough thing for her to, you know, put her life out there like that after all that she's been through, but she was uh, all for it. So, yeah, it's mostly just kind of talking to people, reaching out, seeing seeing who's courageous enough to go on camera. Um, I mentioned how with Daisy, like how she chronicled her um, transition from female to male, and that was done through social media, the usual, you know, platforms, right? Your Facebooks, TikToks, Twitters. Um, you know, I have a little... Uh, Posted on on my wall, and it says "Social media is the enemy." Um, because <laughs> and I and I really do believe that because it, while it does have some benefits, I really do believe that um, it, it, the use of it, for, for, you know, in a lot of ways, has been really kind of negative on, on you know society. And I think the the how a lot of people go online, whether it be someone like Daisy to someone like Ellen Page, who um who really has mm -hmm. used social media and even legacy media really uh, to kind of you know, from promote this whole kind of the agenda um, uh, transition thing. And it's really interesting how I was listening to an interview with Jordan Peterson. He was kicked off Twitter uh, because he questioned whether um, Ellen Page going online and showing her top surgery and everything else, whether that was a good thing because his thing was for her as an individual, I'm sure she's expressing herself in, in, in you know, her own, her own journey, whatever she's doing, but as an overall impact that it can have on people that can have uh that can encourage people like daisy um who are dealing with some really really intense um uh you know uh, mental spiritual battles um into going down a road where for a lot of people there's no coming back from you know i'm sure in your research social media would have is incredibly negative in the way that um in, in oh. how this whole thing just has spread like wildfire yeah, Daisy will tell you herself that she absolutely, I mean, she's still on social media a bit, but she she puts that probably at the very top uh, of the reasons that she transitioned and she calls it perhaps the greatest negative in her life. Like if she, um, and you look back like 2013, 2014, what was happening? You did have like the pro Anna boards, like the pro anorexia, the pro cutting boards that, that transitioned, no pun intended, into pro trans about 2015 and it was all internet and Daisy will tell you she spent every waking moment online uh, that that and if, if she looks back and thinks oh if I could only not have been online I guarantee I wouldn't have transitioned she's mm. like it's it's absolutely not a question in her mind and you'll see families now uh, like parents will ask me like what what can I do my my kids getting sucked into this. Well, the number one thing is you got to get them off their phones. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely the number one thing. And if you do that, um, I, I, I mean, just anecdotally, the success rate in having kids, you know, suddenly their gender dysphoria just isn't an issue is pretty high. <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're completely right about this, Matt. The social media thing is just perhaps, I mean, there's other factors, obviously, but as a medium, uh, there's nothing that compares with the danger of social media. I, I agree. And there's so many things wrong with it. Another thing that's really alarming to me is that I'm a father as well. I have uh, two boys. So I have a 10 year old and a seven year old. My 10 year old is autistic. And the statistics in regards to autism and, and gender uh, dysphoria is, is, is mind boggling. I think 30% of teenage girls, especially, um, underwent transition. And I think a lot of that has to do with just really poor um, uh, uh, therapeutic care, really poor kind of like care from the psych psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, that was just really alarming to me. Did you know of that before going into your research that autism played such a, a role? Because I mean, I mean, my, my I do have an autistic son, and and 
in just the idea that maybe perhaps in, during a therapy session when he gets older, if he might might go down the road of questioning that stuff, I might know about right. it or or might be too far gone is really kind of uh, something that's scary to me. Yeah, I, I didn't know that it was to the extent that it was. I mean, I had heard like, ah, oh, there seems to be an autism factor. But no, I mean, it's 30 percent at minimum. Uh, 30% is, is, is anecdotally probably closer to 50. And there's several factors, right, that, uh, that as you know, like living in a neurotypical uh, context, it's tough to be autistic, right? Socially, you don't, uh, you're not you're not at ease, you're not at ease in your body. And so the the trans cult comes along and is very attractive to autistic kids, kids on the spectrum. Um, they find a not only do they find like a social acceptance and an explanation for their body, but even the way that tra- that autistic kids think, um, they're very much like in their heads a lot and they make, you know, sort of uh, black and white decisions. They think about something a lot, then they make a decision on it and that's it. You know, like we've got it now. OK, we've come to a conclusion on this and it's very hard to pull them out of that. Well, again, trans comes along, presents a, a social acceptance and an explanation for their um, discomfort in their body, and they decide on it, and then it's hard to pull them out. <laughs> and so, yeah, it does make sense that a lot of the kids that uh, are on the spectrum um, get do, do get sucked into this uh, social phenomenon. This is very sad. I mean, you talked about the... Um, like the counseling industry, like the psychological, the way that counseling has changed was also a big surprise to me. Like I wasn't quite aware of how much it had been completely transformed by this. Whereas in the past you go to a counselor and you would hopefully get some cognitive behavioral therapy. Whereas if you do have a false idea, you know, you're anorexic and you think that you're obese, but actually you're 97 pounds. Well, in the past, a counselor would say to you, hey, we need to get your, you have, you're believing false things. We need to get your thinking in line with reality, right? And this makes sense. I mean, that's what therapy is. You have false ideas. We need to line them up with reality. Now you come in and you say, hey, I'm, I think I'm a boy. And they're like, oh, yep, yep, let's let's change your body. I mean, it's <laughs> it's so anti-therapy, really, right? It's so anti-reality in what we should be doing. Yet the counseling industry and the medical industry, frankly, has has just like been turned on its head by this ideology. And I, I did find that really fascinating. I didn't realize like quite the extent mm. to which that had happened. Um, I mean, I knew it was an issue, but. I mean, here in California now, it's illegal. You know, it's illegal for a counselor to use traditional cognitive behavioral therapy on a kid who even mentions that maybe trans is a thing. And why are they mentioning it? Probably because they came out of the GSA club in school or whatever, and it was introduced to them. They wouldn't have been thinking about it naturally. So now we've created this system. I mean, this is the danger of it now. Now we've got this system in in California and many other states where you're literally funneled in like the the therapist can't even do a proper job and evaluate you so now you have these horror stories and there's a few of them in the movie of people who have obvious like trauma you know like obvious reasons for some of their psychological issues hey they were sexually abused or whatever yet the therapist I mean, we talked to to Billy Burley and some others in the in the film. The therapist, I mean, it could be seven years, it could be ten years. I've heard this story again and again. I asked him, did they ever did they ever ask you about your trauma? Nope, nope. <laughs> You're like, what? How how is that possible? How are how are they not seeing that autism is an issue? How are they not seeing trauma? How are they not seeing like, oh, my parents got divorced and my dad always favored uh, his his son rather than his daughter. How are they not seeing that as a factor when you now suddenly want to become a boy, right? And they're not, though. That's the crazy thing. They're not. So, yeah, I didn't. I didn't see all that before I started uh, started traveling around and filming, and it was it was a, a revelation, not not in a good way. <laughs> the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. 
Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. No, I mean, it isn't. I mean, this whole notion of gender affirming care, which is which is going on right now, you have that on one end. Then on the other hand, you have states uh, like over in where you are in the US, California, and other states as well who have these kind of conversion therapy laws. And we have the similar stuff here in Australia. In uh, Victoria, they have it. In Western Australia, they're going to pass legislation in regards to that too, um, where a therapist or anyone else in a, in a position of authority can't even mention the fact that maybe, well, maybe maybe it's not have nothing to do with sexuality. Maybe it has to do with some type of uh, trauma. Maybe it has to do with something else. Maybe it has to do in the context of spirituality. I know in Western, both Western Australia and in Victoria, that even the notion of just, say, a priest um, broaching the subject and saying, well, maybe we need to talk to this in regards to a spiritual context, that could be considered, you know, a, a, uh, you know, conversion therapy. And from that, they, people can get jailed, people get fined, and it's just it, it's remarkable in, in the in the fact that it's almost like the the um they game the system in a certain way that this is the only result you're going to get, um and that really scares the the living daylights out of me. I don't know about you because as myself as a I, I know that you yourself are a religious man, a Catholic. I'm a Catholic as well. I when I broach subjects like this for my children, which hasn't come up that often, only recently, my son. Um, my older son has told me, asked me, what does gay mean? And I had to go through it all. It's like, look, uh, it means an attraction between two people of the same sex. Um, it doesn't mean that we get to ridicule, we don't uh, make fun of, we don't treat them in anyone any differently. But it also says, you know, and then I go into the spiritual context with the church, Jesus, et cetera. There's a, there's a way to, to broach these subjects. But maybe according to some law, me saying that could be some type of, I don't know, right. uh, maybe so the law say, well, maybe your son's curious to the point where he wants to express himself some other way and you stifled that i mean that's i don't know about you uh don as but as a religious man that's uh that's scary oh it's an oh it's an incredibly frightening and and it's a, it brings up a couple of good points i mean one you, parents need to be aware of what's going on absolutely in the in the culture in your schools uh in your in your state province i mean the the laws that are being passed um, are, but also that notice that this is a top down movement. Like you talked about how they sort of gamed the system. That's exactly right. This is not, this is not a bunch of kids suddenly realizing that, oh, you know, I was born, whatever I was born trans or non-binary or frankly, even gay. And then they, they realize that that's not how this is happening. Okay. That is, it is rules. It's rich, powerful people, um, getting laws changed and financing, uh, the educational system, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are making a ton of money off this thing. And it's being pushed on us from that, from that level. So it's not grassroots it's being pushed down. Hmm. And that to me needs to, people need to be aware of what's going on because it's sold as, Oh, it's this, you know, biological thing that we always have suppressed in the culture. No, absolutely not. <laughs> it's, it is a top down movement being pushed by some very powerful people and companies that are making a ton of money and affecting that way. So change the laws, change, uh, buy off um, the, the medical industry, for example. I mean, people don't realize. I mean, I don't know. I hope it's better in Australia. Uh, but in America here, I mean, the, the amount of power that pharmaceutical companies have. I know I know one of the first things that surprises people when they come to the States is how many pharmaceutical ads you see on TV. And mm. so like in Canada, where, where my family, I grew up in Canada, you, know, there's, it's, you can't. It's against the law to actually advertise drugs. Here, your entire, if you sit down and watch an evening of network television, which I don't recommend, I never do, but every almost probably nine out of 10 commercials are pharmaceutical companies. Mm. Um, it is absolutely, they absolutely have a, a tight, powerful grip uh, on the, the levers of the uh, institutions here. So that's, again, is something people need to realize, like, you know, billions and billions of dollars every year are made on uh 
mastectomies for teenagers and and pharmaceuticals that they're you know you could these kids are walking down 12 at a time right a, a junior high group can go from their school from their school 12 girls can walk into a planned parenthood here in california walk out in about half an hour with testosterone parents in fact california is now a sanctuary state you could come from another state as a 15 year old 13 year old without your parents' permission, walk into a Planned Parenthood here and get what amounts to chemical castration drugs off-label and just walk out with them in half an hour. So that's the crazy, I mean, this everything's crazy about this, but I don't know that people really realize just the <laughs> the level of insanity and, and, uh, and power behind it because... Um, and by the way, Planned Parenthood is the is the just to add another level to this. You know, you keep, you keep peeling back the layers of the onion. So Planned Parenthood is the one that is training, uh, you know, 19, 20 year old counselors to go into public schools here in California and be the the GSA club mentor or the counseling, you know, your the suicide watch mentor. They're all just young trans ideologues trained by Planned Parenthood. Um, you look at even like the suicide hotline here in, in the States, the Trevor Project, absolutely run by trans ideologues. So that if you you call the the suicide hotline and you are going to get funneled into uh, trans ideology, it's a, it's amazing in many ways the extent to which they've really sort of set this up. But it's something that we absolutely have to be aware of because, you know, I, I still – I still hear parents like, oh, I don't know, is it just a few people? They can, they're not really doing surgeries on minors, are they? I mean, come on. No, you, <laughs> I, just saw, I just saw a picture of a public school hallway and the, the amount of propaganda just in one public school hallway is like flags and posters. And it's like you're walking through a gay pride, pride parade, but it's not even just gay anymore. Of course, it's all the flags. And it's just like, no, we can't. We can't. We got to be aware of this. And frankly, we can't. We can't put up with it. I recommend now, um, and I've worked in you know public schools, but I recommend now in, in here in California that parents get their kids out. It's yeah, I've, too- I've I've never I never entertained the idea of, of having my kids in the public. They go to a Catholic school, so they don't. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I'm but fortunately here in Australia, I think school choices it's much more uh, prevalent than it is in the states and in, in America. It's really kind of a that's a really that's right. crescent issue that's been going on there. And yeah. you know what's interesting about disconnected that's really important too is that you really show the kind of like the, the philosophical and historical context of, of what is happening here and essentially like i kind of equated to like a ripple turning to a tsunami i mean it's been there for a long time but it's just been building and building and building and i think the really the kind of the crossroad there was going to be the counter revolution during the 60s or the sexual revolution um and you talk about a lot of kind of key figures, but even before that, like people like William Reich and and Margaret Sanger and all these other people that that kind of put the blueprint in of different kind of things. I say the feminist movement, where it's like this revolt against motherhood, revolt against um um us. You know, I think I remember one of your um people in in your um movie was talking about how we tend to the sexual revolution really tended to ignore the fact that we are fertile beings. Um, and they really kind of like try to separate the body uh, from the mind and how kind of like the, it was, it was almost kind of like a hack in a sort of way. Um, and then yeah. you you be pumping with birth control and use contraceptives, all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's really amazing about how a lot of these things that people kind of look back on with kind of like fawning eyes um, and, and how it's propagated in, in movies and in TV shows, et cetera. Really, that's that's the the genesis of what is happening now. Um, uh, we're just seeing like the, the end crux of it, and you know, unfortunately, we couldn't nip it in the bud all the way back there because that that tie was just too strong, wasn't it? Yeah, that's the thing, people. So I I connect it. I mean, there's a long philosophical, you know, tradition, frankly, since you know from the dawn of time that that we have tended to separate mind and body and and not want to submit but you're absolutely right the 20th century and the sexual revolution uh which went supernova in the 1960s um is based upon a separation of my identity from my body so who i am is not related to my body 
I am what I'm uh, this ball of ideas or my will or my desires, but it's this uh, mystical thing. It's it's very it's a very superstitious is the way one uh, Dr. Lappert, I think, describes it in the in the film. It's this uh, I would call it a Gnostic dualism to use the philosophical terms like you, your identity is out here and your body has nothing to do with it. Well, that has some consequences. And, and we but we didn't really realize that back in the 60s. And we didn't really realize that that's what was happening with, for example, the birth control pill. I think that was that when that came online, the ability to separate who you are, particularly as a woman from your body, which is what the birth control pill does. You're a, women are fertile beings. Men and women come together. Sex is a fertile project until you separate it in some sort of arbitrary, uh, non-natural way. And that disconnection, one of the reasons we, we use this title, that disconnection of your um, will, mind, soul, whatever you want to call it, from your body, particularly in regards to women's fertility, I think led directly to all of this stuff. So you see an, an opening of the door then for, um, I think, directly into the, the gay movement, which led directly to the trans movement. And that philosophy of what it means to be human, uh, what we're seeing now is no different from that second wave feminist ideal, actually. So it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of the a lot of the um, fight against the medicalization of kids is coming from traditional feminists and the, the gay movement, actually. So gays against groomers is a, <laughs> I, and I stood side by side with them on the street, by the way, I welcome, I stood side by side uh, with the, here in Anaheim, we had a big rally just a few weeks ago and I'm, a, I'm happy to stand side by side with the feminists and the, and the gays and everyone else to stop this stuff. But I also <laughs> am very clear when they asked me about it after the film, actually, one of the first, we had a Q and a after the premiere and uh, one of the first questions was well don't you see this as a um like a, an anti-gay thing and i'm like well no like you know we're not i don't think we're transing away the the gay for example like this actually that that's no i don't think anybody's born in the wrong body i don't think anybody's born trans but i also and this is going to be confront you know a little bit controversial to people if i grant those two things the logically, it also follows nobody is born gay because that's the same thing. Your identity is in your desires and your will, and it is not in your body. Okay. It's an anti body movement. It's not using your body in a natural way. So, um, those all go together. That's the thing. I'm also anti contraception, <laughs> right? Which again, people, what? Who? I've never even heard of that, right? Well, no, that's because it is an, uh, separating your identity from your body. And this is just the Catholic position, by the way. I mean, it's just church teaching on this, mm -hmm. but um, it's also it's also the classical, like up until 1930, this would have been the classical Christian position mm -hmm. and frankly, every other civilization in the history of the world up until yesterday. I mean, this is, this is not, yes, it, it sounds radical now, but that's only because the last hundred years have been so uh, crazy, like so insane that we've rejected so much of um, what humans have always known. So that yeah. now, I mean, now, I mean, any, you know, plant anybody from frankly 10 years ago, but certainly from a hundred years ago into today's culture and watch, <laughs> watch, watch an hour of YouTube or whatever. And they're going to be like, what's going on? This is the stupidest era in the history of the world. But that, that it all goes together. Your it starts with your philosophy of what does it mean to be human? And so I did, I did want to, I was a little bit warned about that, you know, like, Oh, Don, do you really want to talk about this in the film? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about it in the film because otherwise we're not going to get anywhere on this topic. Like that has to be part of the conversation, I think, uh, because it's so logically tied together. So I know we offended a few people, but it's, that's all right. <laughs> but, you know, that whole concept of what it is to be human is something I actually talk about quite a bit. My thing is people talk about a world that's divided, political class, et cetera. My, I always say, how can we agree on really relatively simple terms as in as in Roman politics when we can't even agree what it is to be human we abort babies by the millions every year yeah. uh, and we can't even call that human we call it fetus 
Um, you put in the whole transition kind of aspect in it as well. Are uh, you born this way? Are you not born this way? There's all these kind of things that are still up in the air and people kind of cherry pick and pick and choose their own kind of things. And we don't never come to agreement of it. And I think the only agreement that I know that I think is that what we've seen in a lot of ways, is kind of like an abomination of creation. I really yeah. do believe that we have been, and I think Daisy talks about it um, herself in the movies that, when she realized she's been given this body, the yeah. body is a gift. Um, I think people need to really take stock in that. Um, a lot of the times what's going on with all of us in regards to the um, our worst natures, the things that are making us destructive and everything else, it has nothing to do with a physical sense. It has to do a lot of time what's happening up here and what's happening in our, in our, in our spirit as well. Um, there's a lyric of mine from a song that I really like. Um, uh, in uh, it goes something like, um, "A bleeding soul becomes a bitter mind." You really need to clean up the stuff that's on the inside to really make everything else work. And I think the, what we're seeing in disconnected, in a lot of other things going on right now, is, is the opposite. People are trying to work from the outside in. And I don't think that works. It really doesn't. And I think there's a kind of like a almost kind of like, you know, I don't want to, I don't use the word flippantly, um, but it's almost kind of like a satanic kind of a kind of connotation to a lot of this stuff in the regards that okay. when it comes to that philosophy of Satanism, especially it has to do with um, um, rebellion. And that's what it comes mm -hmm. down to a lot of time, rebellion of the family, rebellion. Even the thing I mean, it talks about in the documentary, the rejections of your name, which is the first gift given to you from your parents. Um, and by yeah. using the terms like dead name, and I think that goes a long way too. And it's just a, a really fascinating documentary. And um, Don, I just want to say that what you've done here is just really, really important. And um, for everyone out there listening, Disconnected, please go to disconnectedmovie.com. Find this on streaming, find it on DVD there. Um, it's a movie that a lot of people should watch, and parents especially, because I think a lot of times you said before, people, parents kind of take it flippantly. They don't realize just how widespread this is, um, and it really is. I just want to say congratulations to you. Thank you for your time today. And, um, yeah, uh, hopefully we get to talk again because it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it, Matt. And uh, let me just say, I agree with that that last bit. You're you're exactly right. It's an anti-reality. It's a satanic thing. It's anti-God, anti-family. So you're absolutely uh, on the money with that. I appreciate it. And Matt, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's been it's been great to talk to you. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.